Man, you are you are looking extra Jack Whitey lately. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. If it's the, the hair, yeah. I was saying, like, you just need to start doing all these like weird lily lily li uh <laughs> sounds in your guitar, getting the taxidermy, mm -hmm. collecting weird, weird ancient uh sound equipment. <laughs> You're not Jack White. You're Nicholas Rowe. Nicholas Rowe, uh, for those of you who don't know, a uh, great musician. Uh, he has a couple of albums uh, currently out. Uh, he actually just released one uh, in November, The mm -hmm. Circle Remains Unbroken. Um, you can get that. Uh, where, where can you get that? Um, the best place to get it is going to be my band camp. It's uh, nicholasrowe.bandcamp.com. It was released on all... Uh, all platforms, but I'm having some trouble with my distributor who's messing it up. And so sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not yep, on Spotify. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, I, yeah, Spotify, they've been having issues lately. Uh, it all started when the, like Neil Young started beefing with uh, Spotify. Then I noticed a lot of other like labels or just the artists themselves were having this very uh, love-hate, on-again, off-again relationship with Spotify. Um, but mm -hmm. there, yeah, no, I mean, that's good. That's good to hear though. Uh, and then, so yeah, your band camp, I mean, that's like, do you have like a personal website yet or is, yeah, you're... yeah. I have everything on, um, Nicholas Rowe music.com and that's N I C H O L A S R O W E. So I have everything on there. There it is. Yeah. I'm trying to. <laughs> We'll fix that in post. <laughs> yeah. No, hey, that's my that's my line. My catchphrase. I was I was telling people I was like I don't need a swear jar. I mean, even though I need a swear jar too, but like I need a we'll edit it in post jar. Yeah. Like I, I'm dropping at least a, a dollar's worth of nickels in that every episode. So. Well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, I I keep that updated pretty well. Um, and you know I'm on all the social medias and all of that stuff like that. So um good yeah. now so how long have you been doing music uh you know i started when i was in the womb no <laughs> <laughs> no i started at like at 16 and i my dad played growing up um as i was growing up and i i didn't as as a kid i didn't have much uh interest in following in his footsteps and then something just hit me at 16 and i i took to it i um I'm left-handed, so I had to have him uh, restring one of his acoustics uh, upside down for me, and so mm. I kind of had to bug him for a while on that, but he finally did, and I've been doing it ever since, just just Hendri playing. Hendrix in it? Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, I can kind of mess around a little bit on a right-handed guitar upside down, but... You know, I gotta have the lefty. And if someone would have told me at the time, I wish someone would have told me at the time, "Hey, learn how to play right-handed," because you see all those awesome guitars at the music store. Yeah, but there's like two of those are left-handed. Yeah, there's like you can choose between a Telecaster or a Stratocaster. Those are your two choices. Yeah, <laughs> and those aren't cheap ones. <laughs> yeah. It, um, it, I uh, <laughs> had to ask actually. So, I, well, first off, my mom did everything she could for me to be left-handed. She want she wanted me to be a lefty. She wanted to screw me over through life <laughs> in this right-handed world. She wanted me to be left-handed. I'm like, I can be unique in other ways, mom. Like, yeah, at least let me be able to write my write in school correctly, or and not smear the ink, or you know. <laughs> yeah. Um. I actually. So, yeah, she did everything she could. She would smack my hand when I would reach for stuff with my right hand. Really? Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, why? And this is, the, this is the same woman that wanted me to have a Letterman jacket in high school, mm -hmm. but not let me do any sports. <laughs> she wanted me to put band and choir on my Letterman jacket. I'm like, Mom, I'm already bullied. Like... <laughs> You really want me to walk around with a literal bullseye on my back? <laughs> oh, be man. like first string baritone, you know. <laughs> uh, so like yeah, the class ring and everything. <laughs> yep, she. Yep, I still I have one because she's even like I don't care. I'm just gonna buy it for you, and that's your gift. I'm like, you can get me so many other gifts, like ones that I want. But um, no, I. Uh, 
So I actually have a, I have a question since we're talking about uh, left handedness. Um, is there anything that you do do right handed? Hmm. No, I'm pretty strong. I'm pretty strong left handed. Um, so yeah, I don't think I don't think there's anything that I do because I, I don't do a lot of sports. I've never really been good at sports, which is part of why I realized at 16 that I needed some other way to impress girls yeah, as we, playing we, guitar. We would not be here talking if you were good at sports, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. probably true. Um, so, yeah, like I have played a little bit of basketball, uh, baseball, golf, just for fun. And, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all very, very strong left-handed. I'm very – so, yeah, okay. I honestly probably wouldn't be – I don't know if I would have kept with it, to be honest, if I would have tried to play right handed because um, I'm very, very dominant in my left. Mm -hmm. um, I ask because I am right handed, but I, I found out that I eat left handed. OK. Yeah. Apparently, like it's whatever hand that your knife it, or whatever hand that your fork is in is what handed. So you cut with your non-dominant hand, which didn't make sense to me because that's the thing I cut with my right hand but apparently that's supposed to be the hand that has the fork and then you cut with the left hmm it, again, <laughs> again that doesn't make sense to me yeah uh, but and, and if we're being honest i eat both handed <laughs> i don't ever try to think about it i just grab and go you guys have seen me be a professional eating eating on the podcast i don't care i'm far enough from the mic hopefully you guys don't hear, hear the smacking the chewing, the swallowing, um, but uh, yeah, no. So, you, so you've been doing it. You said you were, you were sixteen, so I mean, you've now been doing it uh, fifty years now. Is what you're saying, right? Yeah, 50, yeah, okay. yeah, oh, yeah okay. almost. Um, yeah, so I started out doing like in rock bands, uh, you know, trying to do that at, out of high school, and. I didn't get into folk until a lot later. I like right now, the stuff that I do now is very folky. Um, I have my new, my newest full length, another full length called five things, two EPs um, that are older and they're all very folky, but I got into that in college where um, I guess it all started with, um, I started listening to Bob Dylan, hmm. you know, I started listening to Bob Dylan. I listened to blood on the tracks and it just, floored me it changed everything and um also when i first started i wasn't interested in singing at all i was playing guitar i was rocking out i was just being that lead guitar player and then interestingly enough uh in college i was going through the music program not really liking it because it wasn't what i really wanted it to be but trying to make it work. And uh, I was in a choir and the, at one point it wasn't like a full choir. It was, I don't know, madrigals or something. It was like a small like chamber thing. Mm. And at one point the teacher pulled me aside. She was this really old lady who'd been doing it for decades. And she's like, I got to tell you in all my years of teaching, you're the worst singer I've ever <laughs> had, and I need you to quit. <laughs> and um, and for some reason, that just like I don't know. It just it just like something sparked in me, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start a rock band, a rock band now where I'm the singer. I'm yeah. gonna be the singer now, and um. I, I obviously don't know. I don't even remember being that mad about it. It just was like, well, if she thinks I suck, then I got to do this. <laughs> Showed her. I guess I really did, because here I am on yep. the Destination podcast. That's right. I'm going to send this to her. Peaked. <laughs> right here. You're witnessing the peak of a star. <laughs> Everything else here is just burning out. <laughs> okay. No, um, so I actually, so my journey as a singer, again, even though I make most of my my second living doing, you know, dick jokes, but, um, <laughs> but then I'm also, I'm really getting back into music. And I mean, my, my start in it was so, like the opposite where I actually sang in the rock band first 
Um, I was just playing bass, and I was just fine with that. And then uh, we went through a couple of singers. And at one point, we were just, we were saying, like, hey, can any of us even attempt this? So, like, Destin, give it a shot. And we were doing um, Hawthorne Heights, Nikki FM. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, so I'm, like, it, it was a simple enough of a bass part. Uh, just, you know, a couple, I think it was, like, maybe six notes tops mm-hmm. for the whole song. And uh, so I was kind of getting through it. I just wasn't strong at all. Uh, like it was still very kind of weak and whispery and a little frail. And uh, I did it one time and the band all looked at me and they were just like, all right, we'll put out the word for another singer then. Cause that sucked. <laughs> and, but like I said, it, I mean, it, it, it sparked that, you know what? Fuck you guys. Like, no, I'm like, I could do this. <laughs> um, and that same year, I was placed into choir on a scheduling error because, like, when we we chose our electives, mm-hmm. uh, making the following year schedule, and I remember of the eight choices, I had choir as number eight. And I don't know if maybe uh, I didn't read where like the numbers were reversed, or whatever, <laughs> where like eight meant you wanted it. Um, but yeah, I was placed in it, and I was just so non-confrontational. I'm like, ah, screw it, I'll go for nine <laughs> weeks. Yeah, and I sang, and the teacher her name's Miss Muslupo. By the way, if you're out there, friend me on Facebook. I want to talk. Um, and she was the one that like was like, "You, you're like really good." And I was like, "No, I'm not." My bandmates said I suck. I was like, mm-hmm. "I can't even, I can't sing like a pretty girl like uh, Hawthorne Heights does." Uh-huh. And, uh huh. And she's like, "No, I, you need to continue this." Is like, and I was like, "I don't want to." <laughs> later uh, so we get to like the last week i get my freshman year schedule for high school and i saw that i was placed in uh french one and i had already been in french one and that was the one time i was gonna be confrontational i'm like i'm not doing a whole year of french again <laughs> the same class again yeah yeah so i was like okay, i cannot stand for that so that was like the, the the most free period i had was choir after we did our big concert and she, I like went up to her. I'm like, uh, Ms. Musalupo, uh, can I, can I go to the guidance counselor right now? I have to talk about my schedule for next year. And uh, she's like, I'll give you the hall pass only if you promise to try and get into choir next year. <laughs> and I could have lied to her. <laughs> I, could, I could have been like, yeah, I totally will. Wink, wink. <laughs> But my dumbass, I actually did. I went there. I was like, I addressed French. And then I even asked. I was like, and what's the chance that I can get in the choir next year? Again, I didn't need to do it. But I did. And they they put me in freshman men's chorus. And then the choir director, once again, he confirmed it. He was like, because I was like the only like bass baritone mm-hmm. that was willing to even flip up into a falsetto uh, if need be. Because uh-huh. all the other freshman basses, they're just like all like everyone's impersonation of them is accurate where they're just like, <laughs> like that's all they want to say. Uh-huh. Cause they're, they're it, it, Cause you know, up until last year, they also sounded like little girls too. And then uh-huh. their balls drop <laughs> and they're just so proud of their dropped <laughs> balls. Like, so they're just f- vocally flaunting them all around everywhere, walking the halls, even be like, I'm a real man now. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then there was me that I've sounded like this since I was like 13. And, uh, yeah, this was as low as I went and I'm like, all right, well, and then I, I just knew to flip because I was singing emo music, which is Mm -hmm. girly as shit. And so I knew how to hit that point in my register and yeah, I just kept working at it. I was like, I'd like, uh, go down in my basement. Mm-hmm. And I'd like put like blankets and pillows over my head to muffle the sounds of me practicing singing as yeah. so that so that my parents didn't think like, oh, he's turning into a woman. Like <laughs> it, the, the the change has begun. Um, but uh, yeah. So um, and then like like I said, I went to school for it. So like I said, Ms. Lupo, uh, thank you for the eighteen thousand dollars in student debt. <laughs> That didn't go anywhere, but it was fun. And also to JT Woodruff of Hawthorne Heights. Also, thank you for getting me into student loan debt because I had to prove that I could sing like him. There um, you go. So, 
but yeah, so you so you, you definitely said like Bob Dylan was the the genesis for you there. Any other like people that you're like, I I need to like go this avenue and not be rocking out in Utica? Um, yeah, I, initially it was definitely Bob Dylan. I got really into this is you know early days I got really into like bright eyes. I got really into mm. Connor Oberst and you know everything he was doing. Wilco, Jeff Tweedy. Um it wasn't until like a lot later that I found some of the other early like 70s stuff like John Prine. Um that you know it was just his, his songwriting also blows my mind. And that's the thing about Bob Dylan is like it's you know, it was just more about the songwriting and it was more about the storytelling. And that was what I really became interested in was storytelling. Like this isn't just like something that I use to impress girls or attempt to impress girls and fail. Mm -hmm. It's like, this actually could mean something and I could tell a story and I could, you know, maybe, I don't know, have some sort of an effect on someone for, a positive or <laughs> you know something like so um and then also more recently like jason isbell is one that i really really like um you know again i'm just very attracted to story good great storytelling and great songwriting in the music that i listen to um tift merit is another that i really like so yeah, yeah. I uh, I was gonna say I I got into the other side of storytelling myself, and unlike you, I did it solely to impress women. <laughs> That's it. I don't care about the money. I don't care about the fame. I don't want to be the next Richard Pryor. I just want women. That's it. That's it. I just want a, like a better class. I want to no no women with broad shoulders and double chins anymore. I just how's it going for you not good not good <laughs> just a bunch of women that look like me with more facial hair um, um and i wonder why uh women haven't been answering my messages lately uh, no I, I, i'm kidding now um no first off uh excellent excellent drop of john prine too uh very very underrated like not many people these days know about john prine i actually met him in canada did you really? Yeah, it was. I mean, it was so quick and in passing. Um, I have, I have a, a a family friend in the. He's like kind of about the distance uh, from Toronto as like Newark is to Columbus. Okay. Um, but he himself, he's a country music artist up there. Um, and he he met John Prine. We just met him in like a uh, this like hotel lobby. Uh, I think they were like for a songwriters convention, and he was like one of the key speakers. Wow. And yeah, so I mean, I got to you know, meet him in passing. And, I mean, and unfortunately, the moment itself was a little lost on me just because I at, at that time I had really gotten away from like country and like mm -hmm. Western folky mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, like looking back now, uh, you know, I definitely wish I would have appreciated more because, again, the man's a absolutely masterful songwriter. Yeah. Um, another <laughs> another. And this was this was a core memory that I had forgotten about. Uh, it got brought up about a month ago. Uh, another famous person that I met also in the warm country that I definitely didn't appreciate was I met Blake Shelton. Okay. <laughs> and I was, so I was 15. This was the height of emo Destin. I mean, I had the hair, uh -huh. I had the skinny jeans. I was wearing like devil wears Prada shirts. Uh -huh. um, not the movie, the, mm -hmm. the band. Um uh, yeah, Hathaway Street. I love them. No, okay. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I do love them, but that's besides the point. So I would my parents they met at this country music festival in like Wheeling, West Virginia. Mm -hmm. And so this was I think this was the last year I went. Um and I was just in the campground. It was just after one of the nights. Um it was really, really late. I actually woke up in the middle of the night just because I, I had to pee. And I was like, well, I'm going to get another drink while I'm out. And I get out of my tent at this exact moment that, again, our, our mutual connection in Canada, he was there for the weekend as well. Mm -hmm. And he, he had an in in the business. So he actually somehow was able to get both Blake Shelton and Trace Atkins to come to our campground. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
And and I mean, and this was also, I think this was right after Blake Shelton lost the mullet. So okay. this was what set him on the path to become sexiest man alive in 2017 or whatever <laughs> it was. But this was back in like 20. See, I was a I was a junior in high school, I think. So or no, a sophomore. So 2008. So yeah, he had just chopped off the mullet. And uh, so a lot of people still kind of didn't recognize him, but everyone recognized Chase Atkins and all the middle-aged women wanted to sit on his face. So they, <laughs> they flocked to him and I go to like this giant, like triple wide cooler that the, our campers have. And I'm like, just, I'm looking for like a Mountain Dew. Uh-huh. Uh, Cause I want to go to sleep. I only want a middle, minimal amount of caffeine. <laughs> and and uh, all of a sudden, like, I see another person like digging into the cooler and I look over and it is Blake Shelton. Oh, wow. And uh, he looks at me and he's holding a can and he, <laughs> I probably shouldn't be saying this on a podcast. He hands me a Budweiser uh-huh. and he's like, you looking for one of these? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, of course I was. And, and you know, typical any other 15 year old would be like, Hell yeah, I'm gonna get wasted on this one Budweiser. Woo! <laughs> Alcohol. No, even 15 year old me was I was like, I just want to go to bed, man. I was like, I just want to pop. That's it. But I already I I I was like, this is Blake Shelton's. I mean, I'm like, yeah, of course I want one. Uh-huh. And he he is to me, he he grabs another one. I'm like, we both crack it up and he he cheers me. So I'm like, I ain't gotta do this. <laughs> I watch professional wrestling. I know what happens when you don't cheer Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I was like, yeah. this is kind of the same thing. I cheers them. I mean, I drink this Budweiser. And here's the thing. Like I said, I was pre pre like peak emo Destin. Uh-huh. Nothing about me said I was 21. Like right. <laughs> and uh, so yeah. Uh he uh I drank it and boy did it taste awful <laughs> at 15 years old. I still don't even really like Budweiser. Yeah. Um, so at 15, I really didn't like it. But you know, I had to I had to fake it because I was like, this guy's this guy's famous. Um and uh, yeah, and, and that was that was it. That was, that was my one meeting of Blake Shelton, uh, was him contributing to the delinquency of minors. But also that story was two thousand eight. The statute of limitations is is fine. He don't cancel him. Don't cancel him. <laughs> uh, at least for that, you might have another reason, but don't cancel him on my behalf. I actually uh, I was really tempted right out of high school. Um, I was really tempted to audition for The Voice because that was like right when it started mm-hmm. and they were still you know getting their their footing i wanted to audition and i was like i wanted like blake to pick me and mm-hmm. then like as soon as he turned around and picked me i was even gonna be like so you might not remember this <laughs> back in 2008 you gave me my very first beer ever it was gross that being said and i'd reach into my back pocket and i'd toss him a new budweiser i'm like but now i love it Cheers, bud. <laughs> glad to be on team blake you know um <laughs> But yeah, so, um, we'll edit this out in post. <laughs> I might have to edit that whole story out in post, honestly. I probably shouldn't even be telling that to too many people, especially on our, on our record. Um, but, uh, <laughs> it's just like the time I met Jared Fogel. No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, like I said, um, your so what what is uh, what was uh going on in your life what were you thinking what went in the thought process of your uh newest album the circle maze i broken uh the newest album is some of the like it's definitely some of my favorite songwriting that i've ever done i think it's some of my best work i'm very proud of it and a lot of it just came from oh man that's I don't know if they if there's really a theme to the songs to the album as a whole. I guess the circle remains unbroken is kind of um I've come to a point where like creativity is just something I'm going to do. I'm going to do it no matter what. It doesn't matter to me if I'm getting paid for it. It doesn't matter to me if anyone else really likes it or appreciates it. It's just like a constant thing that I do because I get a lot out of it myself. And so a lot of these songs came out of that mindset of just being creative every day, making it a part of my life. And this idea of the circle remains unbroken is kind of this idea that like it's all 
no matter what, I'm going to find a way to just be creative and keep writing songs, keep writing poetry or whatever I do. Um, so that's part of it. And then one interesting thing that I did with this one is it was all recorded live in studio with two really good friends of mine who I've played with before. I've played with for many years. The one, the drummer, Jeremiah Wagner, like I started an emo band with him like way, way back when I first started playing guitar and mm -hmm. we've been playing together ever since off and on. And then Jonathan Hape, he is, I've been playing or I've known him for a long time as well. And he's just, we owned a studio together. And so, you know, we've done a lot together. He played bass, he did a production and all that stuff. We did it all live. We did it all in just a weekend and we played it, you know, all three of us together. And we did something interesting where after the initial tracking was done, of bass, drums, guitars, if one of us had an idea for something else to add, we all had to come up with something because if one of us was playing, all of us were playing. And so that forced us to come up with some ideas just on the fly, just come up with things that we wouldn't have probably done otherwise. Uh, background vocals, shakers, lead guitars, you know, just all this different stuff and i think it was a lot of fun to record and i'm really really happy with the way that it came out i'm happy with i love the way that jonathan produced it and so i'm i'm really happy with it and um, i think it's great <laughs> if i do say so myself That's, i'm proud of it <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> like i mean i i just recorded my first special and don't get me wrong i can't wait <laughs> for the day that i can look back at it and be like this is dog shit. but yeah. For right now, no, I'm very proud of it myself. And like, not enough artists do or, or allow themselves maybe to even be proud of what they do. And there's it's kind of in the artist mind frame of like, you know, like, yeah, sure, you always want to be better than mm -hmm. you were, but you also have to keep in mind, like, two years ago, you would have been absolutely ecstatic that you uh, achieved that you made what you did. Right. Yeah. So, like, obviously, yes, you'll you'll never get anywhere if you aren't all constantly trying to be better than yourself. But also, no, take take a second or two or a couple weeks in my case, and be very proud. Of, <laughs> yeah. Be very proud of what what you were able to accomplish. And I think part of what I why I like it is because. I kind of also just tried to give up this idea of like the starving artist, the tortured artist. Some of the stuff that I've made in the past was just, I just felt like I had to just like agonize over it in the studio by myself for countless hours. And this was a very fun experience. And so that the fact that something really cool came out of it just yeah. makes it that much better. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And um, I mean, like with mine, I mean, it was over, stuff over the course of five years. There's stuff I've done since like basically day one of stand up. Uh -huh. There was a bit, AKA my opener, but I wrote the day before the show. Wow. And it, all of my comic friends are like, dude, it's like absolutely ballsy of you to like open this spe the show that you spent thousands of dollars to make with something you haven't really tested uh -huh. uh, for a live audience. Like, yeah. So like the, the reaction that people will hear that's the that's the first reaction I've heard for the joke, and uh, because I have a little bit of a grace period between now and whenever we do finally release uh, the special, mm -hmm. uh, where people don't know the material, so I'm I'm now actively workshopping that opening bit the way that you're supposed to, <laughs> work, like the way I've worked everything else in my special, mm -hmm. and I hate I, I do hate that I've already made it so much better than the version that the world is going to get. Yeah, like I've already added a couple new things here and there. I've tightened up some of my delivery, but like I said, even though I want to be better than that, also you, you take a second. You know, don't don't beat yourself up over over it entirely. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah. So I um, also I think so. Did, did, am, am I uh, remembering right? Where you said that uh, Bob Dylan's uh, um. Blood on the Tracks. Blood on the Tracks album. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. Is that is that like your favorite album of all time? That, 
for a long, long time, that's what I would have said is my favorite album. I mean, I feel like, um, so, like when I listened to that album, it just changed every. It just changed the way I thought about songwriting. It changed everything. For a long time, I said that like there's a piece of that album in every song I've written since the first time I heard it. Um, I I think I still believe that. I definitely still believe it, but I think that I have a new favorite recently, starting with when I recorded Five Things, which was came out in 2020. Um, I think I would consider another Bob Dylan album, <laughs> Time Out of Mind, to be my favorite. And I just, I love the way that's, that album sounds sonically. It's just got such a cool sound to it. I love the fact that Bob Dylan is still making music. And I mean, his earliest stuff came out in the early 60s. Early, yeah. And his newest album is also really freaking good. Yeah. And I just saw him in november and it was really really good it's kind of incredible um but time out of mind came out in the mid 90s and that's also an incredible album of course like i i'm one of those people that i don't i consume music slowly i like i like to obsess over an album for a long time before mm -hmm. i move on to something else so it's very possible that i can spend my entire life obsessed with Bob Dylan and never have to move on to anything else because he's got like hundreds of yeah, songs. Yeah. <laughs> but I do listen to other stuff, but I just, I think he'll always be one of my big influences though lately. Um, like I, I love this, this uh, artist that I found recently named Tiff Merritt. She's an amazing songwriter. I like Jason Isbell. I like John Prine. And then, you know, those are probably my main influences, but I listen to all kinds of stuff. Like, yeah. um, I kind of go through phases where right after I get done making an album, like, and I'm kind of just in the, in the very early phases of writing the next one, mm -hmm. I don't want anything that's close to what I write. Like, I don't want to listen to folk right now. I don't want to listen to mm -hmm. Jeff Tweedy, you know, anything like that. I want to listen to hip hop and R&B. Mm. So, you know, like lately I've been listening to, <laughs> I really like this guy named Kato the Friend. He's really good. And then like stuff that people have heard. I, I really like like 90s hip hop. I like mm -hmm. Wu-Tang Clan, Tribe Called Quest. <laughs> yeah. You strike uh, me as a tribe, a tribe guy, by the way. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just, I love, I love to get, as I'm writing lyrics, I like to have that input. So that my lyric, like I like the way that rap and R and B approaches lyrics mm -hmm. differently, and then I take try to take that and apply it to what I do. I don't know if it works. I don't know if it's something that anyone else can see or hear or appreciate, but it gets me out of like the same old rut in my own weird way. So that yeah, because I don't want to just like rehash the same like four John Prine songs, which is easy to do because yeah they're amazing <laughs> yeah i so uh coming from the world of comedy i also have this deep appreciation of hip-hop lyricism because whether they mean to or not sometimes rappers are like funnier than most comedians i know yeah like like lil wayne and kanye they're hilarious <laughs> on the record for <laughs> kanye by the way not kanye is not very funny off the record but yeah um but no, on the record, like some of the lyrics they write, they're just absolutely the, these brilliant one-liners, puns, but that also fit song structure. They still fit attitude. They still like they still very much fit in the hip hop umbrella, even though they're also hilarious. Yeah, and uh, and like I'm currently also writing some rap as well, and like I can't help but because of that, I can't help but every now and then be funny, even when I'm doing rap. Mm -hmm. even though the idea of me doing music is to do something that isn't comedy. <laughs> so like, I don't ever, I don't ever want my music to be seen as inherently funny. Sure. Mm -hmm. Like I said, in raps, I would have moments of it, but like the idea is I want, uh, I don't want to combine the two. I, I don't want to hold, I don't want to half-ass two things. I want to whole ass one. It's <laughs> so like, if I'm doing comedy, I want to stick to comedy. If I'm doing music, I want to stick to comedy. <laughs> um, so 
So that's my my mind frame there as well. And and uh, my opener for my special Jesse Pimpinella, like mm-hmm. he even like even though I I already kind of knew this, it was still good to hear him say it though. He's because he's been to the boat before. He recorded his special mm-hmm. right before the world shut down. Um, so he's been sitting on it forever, and uh, it only just like last year or early last year finally made it mm-hmm. onto streaming. But uh, he wow. he even told me he's like after you do this big huge recording, he's like you need to take like a month or so at, or and just focus on things that aren't comedy. Yeah, like so that's why again I've I've now been taking my writing and I've been doing music and. Mm-hmm. I started writing music back in high school, and there's a song on the EP that is from 10 years ago. And like I'm I'm like, I can look at it, and I'm like, this is only kind of cringy. I can work with kind of cringy. <laughs> yeah. It's the rest of the stuff I wrote back then. It's like whole cringy. I can't do that. But yeah. Um, yeah, there's a yeah, so there's a song on it that I've been sitting on for 10 years now. And uh but yeah, so like I the all the 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 creative juices I've been pouring into that and other things. Like I'm also gonna start writing a, like a few short films. I'm also I've been writing a comedy web series, but unfortunately I just don't have the budget to do it justice just yet. Mm-hmm. So I am putting that on the back burner yet again um, until I get a little more credit to my name. So again, like maybe like three like half hour films. That I can you know take to indie circuits, you know, mm-hmm. maybe maybe get like a writing award for, um, get a little bit of a following, get some money flowing, and then I can focus on that giant web series that I hope to get on like Hulu or HBO or something like that. And then wow. you, then you know, really put me mm-hmm. on the on the map as a writer because like uh, you know even though I want to do the performing, I enjoy the writing aspect of it too. So yeah. Um, what uh what song actually would you say has taken you is there a song that has taken you much longer than the rest to write like on this album specifically is there one that like went through so many evolutions um Um, let me think i think uh all everything on the album was written within the last two years but there were some that like the kind of like the germination or like the very beginning of an idea was planted long ago. Um, Like, you know, if I have an idea, I'll write it in my notes app or write it in the notebook and stuff. And some of those ideas have been sitting there forever. The, what ended up being the single off of this one, which is, I wish that I could sing it for you. um, There was some lines from that, that were in my notes app, like, a long time like maybe three or four years and yeah. and i just i just jotted it down one day and i didn't know what to do with it for a long time and then you know kind of it, it came about much later so yeah you know um i'm trying to think this this one though these songs really kind of came came pretty quick um for the most part if i remember if i remember right I don't think I had any because I I have some old songs um, that, you know, I've been sitting on for a while, but none of them made it onto this newest one. They might might make it onto the next one. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, uh, on my special, there was there was 15 minutes of my special that I forgot. And Mm -hmm. I only recorded it in one take. Typically, comedy specials are shot over like two shows maybe three maybe four mm-hmm. um but i just didn't have the budget or the you know the, the time so i mean mm-hmm. I, I had to be like hey we're one taking it and then that's it and unfortunately yeah there was at least a solid 15 minutes that i forgot just out of you know nerves out of uh crowd interactions after mm-hmm. you know, out of that stuff and i'm pissed because of that 15 minutes was three bits that i had marketing based around like, like t-shirts <laughs> like the punchlines that are on the what i'm trying to sell <laughs> i forgot all three of them wow it, so of, of the four only one of them actually stuck so mm-hmm. that's the shirt i'm definitely going to be peddling because people can at least reference a bit um i actually uh you you, you know wesley right mm-hmm. uh wesley Elish. yes i i even told him i was like i'm tempted to do something that almost no comedians do but it's very common in the music world which is like the deluxe reissue uh-huh 
because uh, you know comedy is almost almost strictly live albums, mm -hmm. so you don't you can't really do that. But uh, I'm tempted to do it. Just be like add those 15 minutes of like three bonus tracks mm -hmm. of what I, I was like. Here's the bits that have T-shirts now. Buy, now you can buy the T-shirts. They're just from a from yeah. a different show or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll I'll add in there like live from and then like whatever room or show I did that for. Yeah, it's a lot easier to do that if it's just audio. It's harder. Yeah, I could do not do that video. with the with the DVD. That would have to be an audio only, uh, deluxe reissue. Yeah. Or there's, or there's just a cut my loss and uh, just hope that people buy the the merch just because they like it um yeah. and then just maybe or or maybe save them for the next special but i already have i already have the next two specials in mind because i actually want to write an entirely clean show because i'm not a clean comic okay. and i'm trying to work right. on it um i've even been trying to just swear less in general um i want to write a strictly like tv clean show um just because it, it sells it gets you if you if you can do a lot of clean yeah i did a clean show this last friday but i didn't know it was until the morning of when he's like oh by the way i forgot to mention this is a clean show i'm like you could have told me that when i signed on because <laughs> like i already had a set plan and I, my closer was definitely not clean the rest uh -huh. of it was the rest of it was fine uh -huh. but the closer the way i've done it is yeah. not clean so i had to i had to clean the closer up because it's also one of my only Valentine's Day stories, and it was a Valentine's Day themed show. Okay. So I was like, I normally I would just be like, all right, well, I'll research another closer here. But I was like, no, this one it fits the theme. It's seasonal. I mm. like I had to do it. Um, it worked fine. And ironically, there was a guy in the crowd that, that got like way too drunk and he uncleans the show up for us. <laughs> oh, he was raunchy. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, I, I want to write an entirely clean show. Uh, one specifically I put in for a, a festival of my dreams. And if I get picked for it, I'm going to ask them if I can record the set I do. Because it's going to be a half an hour of Shrek themed material <laughs> for Shrek Fest. <laughs> and the thing is that in itself, if I just do that as a straight to YouTube special, uh -huh. I'm sure that would do wonders for me. Because yeah. the, the, the Shrek fan base is very strong. Uh, we we have a group of a hundred thousand people. If I if, if I put, we. yeah we we the Shrek army, uh, I'll put them I'll put a meme on that page, and I mean it gets like I, I've gotten over a thousand reactions on just those memes alone. So wow, I mean, yeah, just putting that on YouTube alone would do great for me. And there's just I don't know this there's, there's a nice little bit of ironic marketing there of like mm -hmm. the idea of an entirely Shrek show, but because it's a basic because it is a kid's uh ip mm -hmm. naturally that means i would need to try and be clean about it so th that right there that's a very easy half hour clean material for me but i also want to do just clean in general and then i have the next dirty one already mm -hmm. um working so yeah um i'll say you already you already turn in and burn it for the next one yeah yeah i started writing again and um I just I try to write you know pretty much every day do a little bit here and there um, or just do something creative so I've already got the ideas coming already I honestly already have enough enough for a new album but I'm not looking to record anytime soon I'll just mm -hmm. I don't know what I'm gonna do like I, I really should play some shows but I hate booking I just hate everything about it yep so I don't. <laughs> yeah, I and and I uh, like I, I'm I'm a comic first and then a producer second. Like I only produce to give myself quality stage time. Mm -hmm. But I'm also don't get me wrong. I'm also very happy to give my fellow comics that same quality stage time or more even because typically I I fall on the sword. I go as host, so mm -hmm. I'm only I'm doing a little less time than them plus some of my time is even spent just doing your basic, like turn your cell phones off, no talking, you know, yeah, that yeah, like yeah. general housekeeping announcements like that. Um, but um, the thing is other comics, they only see me as the producer though. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Like if I ever get hit up about gigs, it's because they want on mine. It's never because they want me on theirs. And that's the thing. I mean, like, no, I, I was a comic first. I've been doing stand-up for five years. I've mm -hmm. only been producing shows for, because COVID doesn't count. I've only mm -hmm. been producing for about two years. Yeah. Um, and like I said, I only do it as a necessary evil. I don't, even though the, the theater kid in me enjoys putting on a, a, a big production, like when I do like the roast, mm -hmm. that brings out the inner theater kid in me. But, yeah. um, you know, I mean, like the, the booking aspect of it sucks. I cannot wait. First off, I can't wait till I don't have to produce my own shows for me mm -hmm. to get good stage time. And then I can't wait for when I can afford an agent and then I can just go about my day willy nilly, go to the gym, you know, yeah. ride at home, do what I want. Um, but that's what we're all working for. Yeah. Uh, so, hey, uh, unfortunately, I think we're about to the end here. Um, so I know you said it. Uh, I know you said it earlier, but let's just, uh, you know, clarify where all people can find you, where they can support you. Yeah, you can find everything at uh, nicholasrowmusic.com. That's where you can find links to the music, to all my social media stuff, and the best place to listen to the new album and purchase it is nicholasrow.bandcamp.com. So that's where I'll be online. And follow me on everything. I don't post a lot. So you don't have to really worry about me like blowing up your stories or your reels or your whatever. <laughs> Unlike some of us. <laughs> the yeah. amount of bridges I have burned <laughs> from having to constantly promote stuff. Follow me and you will yeah. immediately forget that you did because I will. <laughs> I, I don't have much of a presence. <laughs> He's like the really cool moons. Like you only got to worry about them like once every like four times a year, maybe yeah. <laughs> like the, the occasional blood moon, the occasional eclipse. That's Nicholas yeah. Rose social media. <laughs> well, but like, I, like you said, follow him on all those as well. Uh, Nick, thank you again for stopping by. Thanks yeah. for talking and uh, looking forward to what you got in the future. Thanks, man. Thank you. Yep. And now a musical performance from Nicholas Rowe. Well, I see you soon try to write another song When I got a hundred others that are only half done They done stripped the parts and left the rest Somewhere in the junkyards of my mind I don't recommend you look for them You never know what you might find What's the use in trying to explain who I am? I am just the combination of every book I've ever read Every skyline I've looked upon And every tune I've ever hung Every alleyway I've stumbled down And every girl I've ever loved But I, I, I wish that I could tell you how I feel And I, I, I wish that I could let it all out I, I, I wish that I could open up my heart to you. I, I, I wish that I could sing it for you, sing it for you now. Sometimes there just ain't nothing left that needs to be said But I got a concrete mixer rolling thoughts around my head Spits them out, I catch it in a notebook And I call it a new song Oh, my deepest fears and worries set to melody So you can sing along But I, I, I wish that I could tell you how I feel I, I, I wish that 
I could let it all out. I, I, I wish that I could open up my heart to you. And I, I, I wish that I could sing it for you, sing it for you now. Oh, yeah. Sing it for you now. Oh, yeah. Sing it for you now. Sing it for you now, oh, yeah. I wish that I could, I, I, I wish that I could tell you how I feel. And I, I, I wish that I could let it all out. <laughs> I had to ruin that with my faith.